Hey everyone, we are in the truck here at the house. It's a Sunday. Well, this is just a start. This is how we usually travel. We go to church and then we come home and we kind of take, take our time because everybody knows if you try to rush, you're gonna, gonna mess something up. Um, we like to travel on Sundays because we like to be in church on Sunday mornings. And we well, typically, I like to be. I'm the pastor, so the pastor. I have to be there on Sunday. So, and then we typically come home on a Saturday. Yeah, uh, but we're close, so we'll be coming home some. Um, yeah. We're heading out of town because there's a minister's conference going on, and we're going to that. But we're going to a new campsite. They've just started it. <laughs> They've just started it. So we're going to give a review of that place. We'll let you know where that's mm -hmm. at. It's in the Statesville area. We did talk to the owner. Very nice guy. Uh, one of the owners, I think. But uh, we're going to have him on the review. He said he'd like to be interviewed for the review. So we're going to do that. But uh, let's talk a, bit, a little bit before we leave. Um, we didn't have nothing loaded. But it's two, almost 3 o'clock. We're just going a little over an hour away. And... Uh, so we just took our time. Now, I mean, we loaded our clothes up, the food up. And one thing we've learned on the food is we load it up. She comes out and puts it kind of where she wants it because if I do it, I just throw it you in. You just throw it in. And I, I put everything where I want it. And I space everything in the, the fridge freezer. So that saves a lot of work when you get there. Yes. I so, still wipe things down. You know, obviously, if a camper set and it sat for two weeks, it gets dusty just opening and closing the door when you come home and get everything out. But one thing, this is a tip, and you, you may already be aware, and you may already be doing this, but we're in the process of getting healthier. We want to quit saying losing weight because we just love the body that we've been given. God's blessed us with yes. but We're going to take better care of them. Um, but we wrote out our menu last night of what tentatively we were going to eat this week. Yes. So from that, I made a list. Well, let, let me interject something in here. One thing that we started doing uh, months and months ago when we started camping out, I would have her sit down with her. We'd sit down the night before or first thing that morning and make a list of everything we're taking. That way we go through, check, 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 because if I don't do that, I'll leave something. So we've got into a habit of making a list. So she got it, she set down everything she needed to take to cook with, because I know we do have to go buy a couple of things, but we, what we had at the house, she checked it. Yep. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed the last couple episodes because we cooked out, and that's what people's been asking for. And we're gonna do some of that on this trip. Uh, we're going to cook out some. But she made a list. Maybe this is my and, grocery list. And there's her grocery list. But she made a list of what we uh, we needed to take. So we did that. We just took our time. Again, if you get in a rush, I've got in rushes. Oh and I've, I have gosh. fallen down. Oh, yes. I've hit stuff against the truck. Uh, so I'm learning, even while I'm loading up, just enjoy the journey. Yeah. Just enjoy it. Well, and it's hot and humid in the south. So... Um, and typically we leave in the afternoon and it's hot on Rodney, I know, to um, hook the camper up and all of that. So um, all you need, and you're frustrated anyway when you're hot and you're sweaty. So always keep that in mind. But we prefer to arrive at a campsite before dark, if at all possible. So take that into consideration. If we needed to go a far distance, I know some people say you never go more than three hours um, away, and that's and arrive before three. It's some something about the the threes. Yeah, well, sometimes check ins at three. Yes, at a lot of places, two yes. to three, and sometimes and three o'clock is a good spot uh, to kind of shoot for. We're going to be missing that, but by an hour, by an hour, yep. Yeah. But that's fine. Yeah, so, uh, again, take your time when you're loading up. Don't get in a hurry. Uh, oh, and another tip. Have something planned for your dinner. Yeah, because so many times there are those issues, like right now it's getting ready to rain. So, uh, you, you want to plan for a delay in getting in your campsite or something coming up. And if you have not prepared... 
you're number one going to go off your diet or you're going to be frustrated because you're going to be hangry. Yes. And so we did eat an apple and we're hydrating. So we'll have we'll have a dinner when, once we get the campers. So. Well, one thing, she, I usually, and it, it hurt me more than helped me, I would eat one meal a day, but it would be in the evening. I would start at six and, or seven, eight, eat whatever, and eat, eat until I go to bed, then wake up in the middle of the night and eat. So she's got me eating two meals a day because I really don't. I've never ate breakfast. It's like an intermittent fasting you're doing a little bit of in the morning. Yeah. So uh, there was something else I was going to say uh, that people needed to do. I'll think of it here in a little bit, and we'll tell you later. Oh, this is one thing. We've done this before. Um, say that, you know, we're leaving today. We know we're going to get up there a little later. Uh, say, because sometimes... When you've worked, we've not got there to eight. Or later. Or later. So we kind of think about that. So if the other day she would have cooked something, we would have made extra mm -hmm. and just warmed that up for the first day we got there. So it would be easier yeah. for us well, and not to worry about food. Ca uh, campgrounds won't let you come in after a certain time. They have quiet hours. Um, so you take that into consideration. And I know some people say, I'm not going to pay for a campsite just to sleep. So like if you get there at 9, 10 o'clock, the way, used to be that way we look at it is if you already are there, now you have to take all the factors in. Are you going to be extremely tired? Is it extremely dangerous? Do you know the park? Um, we prefer to be there. And then you wake up in the morning and you have your whole day. You paid for the night, for the one night, but you get the whole day next day instead yes. of getting there later and then you yeah. really are tired the whole time you're, you're robbing there. Peter to pay Paul regardless, but, you know, it's everybody, it is the best to arrive before dark. Like well, Francis, the minister's conference starts tonight, but I won't go probably to tomorrow night uh, because we're heading up today, but I had church today, so I didn't want to rush up there mm -hmm. and, you know, but now sometimes we do go ahead and put some stuff in like the night before. Some stuff we just uh, we just figured we'd do everything today. So it's raining. How many trips have we went on since last year that it has rained? A lot. We're going to get up there and we're excited about you being on this journey with us. Like always, if you like our videos, subscribe, hit the bell, give us a thumbs up. That really helps push us out. And share and comment. Again, Teresa and I always tell you, we love going back and forth with people when we comment. But again, we just broke 6,500. So thank you to all our new subscribers. We really appreciate it. We count it an honor that you're part of this journey with us. We love sharing our videos, but it's a community. So share things. Let's talk a little bit as we're going on this. But let's get on down the road and uh, see what we can get into. We'll share a little bit while we're hooking up. You saw that before, but we'll show you around. If it's not pouring the rain, we'll show you a little bit of the campsite here in a little bit. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's not just sprinkling. sprinkling, it is pouring the rain. And the radar shows that it is blue pouring. We're kind of driving into it. We probably should have waited an hour. But you can get kind of excited when you know we're going somewhere. So I'll have her pull up the radar picture and show it to you. Hey guys, we are getting ready to go out to visit. What is it, baby? We're going to go to Fort Dobbs. Yeah, on this episode, it'll be Fort Dobbs, and also we may go on this episode. We're not sure it's going to be the next episode, this episode, to. You're talking about to Love Valley? To Love there Valley. There's a little country store you wanted to look at. So, we're going to go check those things out. We've kind of been up here, as you saw, we left the house uh, on a Sunday, and then we went to uh, ministers. some ministers' conferences and kind of just sat around here at this campsite. We're going to do a review on this episode or next episode uh, on this campsite. It's a brand new campsite. It's just been open really for three months. Uh, we've got to talk to one of the owners, really nice young man. And um, he's a veteran. Well, he works in the military. Then his, uh, his father's a veteran. So uh, they've got some things here planned that they're doing. Uh, right now you park, everything's kind of gravel and stuff. Mm -hmm. But he's got some stuff planned that they have already started paying for and people are supposed to start showing up doing this uh, before he gets 
matter of fact, he's been deployed. One of the owners are being deployed here uh, in the next uh, three or four weeks. So uh, if you pray, pray for him. We're not going to mention no names, but pray for him as he uh, goes and serves our country uh, during this time. He uh, is in reserve, so he's been called up and is going to be deployed. But we're going to show you the campsite uh, later on again in this episode or next episode, and we'll tell you some things they're doing, things we like. It is quiet. I do like that. Internet's good. We do like that. But we'll go over all that stuff in a few moments. But right now we're going to head up. You're going to have to go get something to eat. We got a late start. We rested this morning. Because of, uh, She's going to blame me, which I am probably the one I've been working on stuff of, uh, for the channel and ministry stuff. But we're going to go get something to eat. We'll take you on that with us. But then also either this episode or next episode, we'll be cooking here at the campsite. We're going to take that. Score, when I it say that. It's hot today, and they are, um, there is a small chance of a thunderstorm, so. We're going to have to kind of work around that today. Well, when I say this episode or next episode, what I'm trying to say is I don't want to make this so long. So yeah. it's according what we get today, if we'll make it up into two or one episodes, because we know your time's value when we do appreciate you watch it. But let's see where she's going to pick us to go eat, and then we're going to head to a fort. She'll explain to you about the fort when we get there. I'll probably you know. do a voiceover. Are you? Okay, so we'll just take, we'll go through it, then she'll come back on, uh, do a voiceover, and let you know more about the fort. It's very uh, interesting mm -hmm. about the fort. So let's get up the road here and see what we're going to get to eat. Go into Twisted Oaks. American, huh? Oh. Twisted Oak, sorry. That's what we're going to head into eat. Uh, it's in downtown, huh? Statesville. Statesville. It's a cute little town. It's a, it looks nice. We drove down here while we were at uh, the meetings. So, but we'll go inside. They got outside seating. And uh, so we're going to go inside here and grab something to eat. We'll, we'll just drop a photo in what the food looks like and we'll tell you. Well, no, I'll videotape. I'll show you what it looks like. So I got a filling, no food. steak, ribeye sandwich, and I got the trout. Okay, so let's try this and see what we want. There's a seared trout with shaved Brussels sprouts and some rice. And you got the ribeye sandwich, looks like this homemade fries with onion rings on top of it. <laughs> This is uh, Fort Dobbs, uh, the original side of the original fort where it was built in 1756. Uh, we've reconstructed it here. Uh, it was built uh, just a few years ago, 2019, and served as uh, barracks for uh, North Carolina provincial soldiers uh, throughout the French and Indian War. Uh, fighting with the Cherokee in this area later in the war uh, resulted in a battle that took place here on this hilltop in February of 1760. 
after the war was finished, uh, the original fort was abandoned uh, and rotted away by the early 1800s. Uh, the 1960s and 70s, archaeologists were here uh, digging the ground, finding clues, uh, artifacts, evidence of where the original fort had stood, which is where the new version is reconstructed here today. But, uh, So the French and Indian War began in 1754 up in western Pennsylvania. And this war is the result of a land dispute between the British colony Virginia and France. See, Virginia thought that their borders went all the way to the Mississippi River and all the way north to the north side of the Great Lakes. There's a problem with that. Yeah. Number one, you've got hundreds of thousands of Native Americans living in that territory. And number two, the French had already been there and were deeply economically involved with the nations living there. Now, Virginia wants to break into that territory and they start making inroads. So Virginia decided to build a series of forts from Lake Erie down to what is today downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The southernmost fort called Fort Duquesne in downtown Pittsburgh before it was downtown Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> that fort blocked Virginia's westward expansion, so Virginia decided the best thing to do to solve that problem would be to raise an army and send them west, because that's how you get your way, right? <laughs> now, that army, as it's traveling west, the commanding officer died, and a 22-year-old hot-headed kid with no military experience whatsoever became the commanding officer. Uh, this young man, who had never led troops before, named George Washington, <laughs> decided he's going to keep pushing west. Towards the end of May, he discovered a small group of 38 French soldiers who were camping about 45 miles southeast of the French fort, and he decided that they were obviously a threat. So as the French were sleeping, he surrounded their camp, and when the French began to wake up in the early morning hours of May 28, 1754, George Washington ordered his men to open fire. And he started a war. So it turned out later that these French soldiers were actually on their way to talk to Virginia about this land dispute. Make some diplomats, right? When diplomats get killed, the world goes south. It led to fighting that spread all the way to Nova Scotia, and all the way down into what is today South Carolina within a very short amount of time. By 1757, however, the fighting that started here in North America had spread to Central America, the Caribbean islands, to Europe as far east as Russia. It spread to West Africa, India, and even the Philippines over in the Pacific. This is truly a world war. Now with all of that going on all around the globe, where we are now, was the frontier of North Carolina. Now, if we had been standing here when those shots rang out in Pennsylvania, there were only about 30 families living within 10 miles of where we're standing. Okay? Most of these people are fairly recent immigrants, and they're coming down here because North Carolina has about the cheapest land anywhere in North America. Um, just for a little perspective, while we can't really make modern equivalents to cash value, um, in Pennsylvania to buy 100 acres of land would cost you 300 shillings. 100 acres of land in North Carolina is five shillings. So poor people are buying hundreds of acres at a time. Uh, typically our most, most common per, uh, rate was about 600 acres. So. Interestingly though, most of the people coming here are farmers or tradesmen. They are not hunters. Most of them did not own weapons. Maybe one in five families had a gun at their disposal. But frankly, you don't need a gun 
especially when you're farming and raising cattle and hogs. Uh, and if you're a tradesman, you're making stuff and you buy food or trade for food. Mm -hmm. So guns aren't a necessity. But things changed in September of 1754 because in that month, Shawnee and Miami from up in Ohio made their first attacks on the frontier of North Carolina. And this spread panic because they are pop they're attacking a population who are scattered miles apart and largely unarmed, defenseless. Mm -hmm. Followed on the heels of that, those attacks, in Virginia, there started uh, attacks began to develop, and that sent floods of refugees into North Carolina, and that even spread even more panic. Early in uh, 1755, the royal governor of North Carolina, Arthur Dobbs, went to our General Assembly, our elected officials, and he asked them to raise 200 soldiers to defend the frontier. Well, the General Assembly met all the way out at the coast of North Carolina, and they didn't care what was happening to the frontier. And they didn't want to spend any money on them. So after a little bit of conjoling, uh, Arthur Dobbs managed to get them to agree to pay for 50 soldiers to defend the entire frontier oh of North Carolina. And in the summer of 1755, those guys came to this hilltop to establish a base camp. This hill was picked because we're about halfway between Virginia and South Carolina, 120 mile stretch they're supposed to cover. We're on the edge of the frontier, but not past the edge of the frontier. Uh, we're at the confluence of two creeks. This hill was really special. It was 300 yards that way, there's a spring. That nearby water source made this very attractive because then you didn't have to travel a quarter mile for water. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time that these soldiers came out and built a couple cabins, there were no forts anywhere near the frontier. So late in 1755, after Governor Dobbs was able to squeeze a little bit more money out of the General Assembly, he used it to order these soldiers to start building a fort that he designed and very cleverly named after himself, because that man did not have an ego. Um, anybody been to Atlantic Beach before? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fort Macon? Mm -hmm. Almost a quarter mile out into the ocean used to be land. There was another Fort Dobbs there. Like I said, no ego. <laughs> <laughs> so the original fort's construction began in about December of 1755, and it was completed in about October of 1756. It's about 10 months to build what you see recreated here. Now, this thing is going to serve a few purposes. Number one, it is a living quarters, a barracks for those soldiers. It is also a place where refugees, locals, could seek shelter when there are attacks. But the way this thing is designed, it's only going to house 50 men. But they set it up so that on each of the three floors, there's about 100 firing ports. So in theory, you can fire almost 300 muskets from this thing at once. But there's only 50 guys living in it. They are counting on locals to come in and help defend it. But the locals are unarmed, largely. Uh, so the colony ended up, because they didn't want to raise more troops, uh, they ended up just shipping a bunch of guns and ammunition to the fort and turned it into a bit of an arms depot so the commanding officer could issue arms out as needed. Okay. Now, before we head inside, got to give a couple of ground rules. Does everybody remember my name? Did I tell you guys my name? James? This is your way to say, no, I didn't. James. Um, I'm mm -hmm. sorry? James. Oh, you're the second person today to call me James. Oh my you God. said it right at the start, but I didn't get it on camera anyway. I, I am tours over. <laughs> oh, say you're it again. the first to call me John today, Jason. Jason, um, well, like Jason. All right. Jason. It's fair. No, it's okay. I said a lot of stuff in between then and now. Um, if you guys haven't figured it out yet, I can talk kind of fast. <laughs> and I sometimes forget to take breaths in between sentences. And some people think that makes it hard to ask questions. I will not get offended if you guys interrupt me. I grew up in upstate New York. I think I can take it. Um, <laughs> but uh, more importantly, this building and everything in it, it's all reproductions. That means you guys can actually pick stuff up and play with it. I just have to ask that we don't handle the guns, swords, and bayonets. Okay. okay? 
Everything else is fair game as long as you promise things won't leave your hand at a high speed towards my head. Mm -hmm. Any other part of my body is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you guys have questions? I was wondering why the Miami came so far south. Uh, Miami and Shawnee had a little bit of an axe to grind. Mm -hmm. um, so the Miami and the Shawnee are kind of mixed. Uh, along with the Lenape and Wyandots and we and there's a billion of nations up there. You're obviously very familiar. Um, sounds like it. Well, I grew up in Michigan. Okay. Southeastern Michigan. So all right. The and all that. Yeah. So um, the the Miamis were actually spread really okay. far and wide. Um, everybody lines had been drawn uh, largely due to economic spheres of influence. Um, people who are closely trading with the French are obviously going to be French allies, while those trading with the English are English allies. And the Shawnee, I don't want to make it sound like it's not going to come out right. Uh, the Shawnee had a lot of sway, so it was pretty easy to get <laughs> other people to be like, go do this, yeah, let's go do this. Um, it just seems like a yeah. long way in it is. Um, the, the southernmost uh, town that there were Miami living in is, um, it is right where, you know, the top of Kentucky, where it makes a big, uh, where it makes a northward bow. There was a town right there that was a Shawnee, mostly Shawnee and Miami town. Um, that was, uh, I'm drawing blanks right now. It was a really famous uh, Shawnee chief. Uh, way before Tecumseh. Um, he was one of the most powerful guys in this period. Uh, that was his town, and mm -hmm. he was really, he had a lot of sway. So it wasn't hard to get people to. <laughs> that was a very long winded way to say, yeah. All right, so we're going to head to the right here. Sorry about that. Um, So the original Fort Dobbs had three storage areas in it. Uh, below ground, under the half of the building behind me, there was a cellar, and that's used primarily for food storage. The back corner of the cellar was a small round room that was called a powder magazine. That's where they did all their makeup. Um, it's where the gunpowder was stored. They didn't do makeup. Um, so this room is our third storage area. It is both a storage Place. It's a workshop and a little bit of an office. Now, the most important stuff in here are the contents of the big barrels. Uh, almost everybody that's uh, over the age of about 16 wants to guess booze. Uh, it is not. Uh, it's food. Mm. Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> now, these guys, these soldiers, are serving in a military that copies the British Army. And that includes their rations. Every single day, each man gets one pound of meat, a pound of bread, a cup and a half of either rice or peas, about a quarter cup of butter. They get something like oatmeal or grits and for breakfast, coffee, about a little bit of vinegar. You get four ounces of rum or whiskey every evening, and you have to have gardens so you can grow fresh vegetables to supplement your meals. You're looking at about 3,500 calories a day yeah. per guy. It's a lot. It is a lot. Um, they don't have labor laws. There's no OSHA. <laughs> they are working sun up to sundown seven days a week. Uh, when they're not working on the fort, you know, they have to go out and patrol. And these soldiers are covering an average of about 15 miles a day. And they're lugging close to 50 pounds a year with them. That takes a so they lot burn. of energy. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to all that food, you know we need water to survive. And that first water source, the spring 300 yards down the hill, is a bad water source because if you come under attack, you're cut off. So at some point, the soldiers dug a well inside the fort. That well is right here below this. Um, in 1968, archaeologists have been working out here for about three years. And they decided it was time to see what was in the bottom of this well. So they started digging it out, and they accomplished it the same way the soldiers did 260-some years ago. A guy was lowered down by a rope with a bucket and a shovel. 
<laughs> when they got to the bottom, it was discovered that this thing was about four feet or so in diameter and 41 and a half feet deep. That is very deep. Uh, if you want to visualize that, you put your toes on that crack, your nose is going to be about 41 and a half feet from that wall. It's a long way down. Now, a few things were discovered. Number one, they found uh, the remains of a pulley, parts of a broken bucket. There were a bunch of charred timbers, some few small artifacts. It was also discovered that this thing had no evidence of ever getting a lining. No stone, no wood. Are any of you familiar with North Carolina red clay? Yeah, it's solid red clay all the way down. And it is unbelievably dense. This thing also filled with water once it was dug out. Uh, not all the way, but it had a good four or five feet of water in the bottom of it year round. Right up until 2016, we could feasibly get water out of this thing. And at that point, we couldn't anymore because they decided to cap it for safety reasons because they didn't want people dropping their cell phones or little kids into it. Cause Bad <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, it's uh, the functional well is right there under a concrete cap. Um, it's pretty amazing that for 60 years it sat open and never collapsed. It is a testament to our horrific soil. It's um, pretty cool. Do you guys have questions so far? Any other questions? How, what was the diameter, Jason? About four or four and a half feet. Okay. It was actually more uh, kind of almost cone-shaped, mm -hmm. but we can't tell. So in uh, 1848, uh, the well was reopened by local farmers. Um, we don't know if that cone shape was because that's what they did or if it was originally done. But they only got like 15 feet down and gave up. Where, where did their sewage go? I'm sorry? Where did the sewage go so that they didn't contaminate them? So uh, the military, really, they understood that if you uh, mm -hmm. relieve yourself near water sources or food, you're going to get sick. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, where forts are concerned, you're going to have what they called a sink, mm -hmm. a trench, okay. uh, about 50 yards from any habitation, away from water. We don't know where the sink was. We okay. haven't located it. Um, there is a second flanker off the, uh, the northeast corner of the fort, off the officers' quarters. Uh, the six big windows in the two flankers, each would have a little tiny gun like this. I think most of you saw these inside. Um, this cute little gun has a cute little name. It's very clever. It's called a swivel gun because it swivels. Uh, they're very clever in the 18th century. Uh, the other name for this gun is half pounder because at longer ranges it can fire a half pound solid iron shot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so two soldiers should be able to load and fire that in about 40 seconds and you would be able to, within two or three shots, place one of those through one of the house's uh, windows about almost 300 yards away across the street. Um, oh, thank you. What kind of damage is that? I, yeah, it doesn't explode, but what it impacts might, depending on how soft the tissue is. It's really nice. Um, it's a preferred ammunition for this gun is not that shot, because out here it's really hard to hit tar human targets because they move around. Um, the preferred ammunition for that gun is a package of 12 musket balls. Grape shot. No matter where you stood outside of the original Fort Dobbs, there was no cover here. You would have been looking up the barrels of two or three of these things firing grape shot at you from different angles. This is a horrific place to attack. And it was attacked one time. We have found grape shot fired by the original Fort's guns 220 yards from here. The far tree line over there, on the other side of this little field, that's 200 yards. The battle that was fought here was fought between former allies. In 1758, the Cherokee were such close allies that they sent almost 700 warriors to Pennsylvania to help the British Army and the colonists capture Fort Duquesne. 
that French fort that stood in what is today downtown Pittsburgh. The campaign was successful, but in September of 1758, as the Cherokee are heading home in small groups, Virginians just north of modern-day Roanoke, Virginia, started ambushing their allies. We don't know why. In one instance, a Virginia officer, a high-ranking Virginia officer, was with the Cherokee and on the receiving end of one of those ambushes. Over the course of about two and a half weeks, the Cherokee uh, lost as many as 40 warriors. We don't know how many were wounded and died later. This upset the Cherokee. Now, they still had to get home. They had to travel all the way across North Carolina down into South Carolina. Are you folks familiar with where Clemson University is? Mm -hmm. Okay, that is right in the heart of the southernmost Cherokee towns. Cherokee had to head there, turn north, and go up to get home. Just north of Clemson, Fort Prince George is under Lake Kiwi. And the Cherokee, number one, they stopped and said stuff to Virginia saying, hey, please do something about these murders. And then they also complained to Fort Prince George, and the soldiers at Fort Prince George said, quote, you should have complained to Virginia. Native Americans in the 18th century had their own justice system. Okay? The Cherokee gave the colonies a chance. They tried to get them to do just, do right as allies. In native cultures, when a warrior, or not a warrior, but when any native person is murdered, the warriors of their communities are bound. They must go to the nation that killed their friend or loved one, and you take a life for a life. It was preferred to take captives, preferably younger people, who could be brought back to the towns, given to the family members of the murder victims, who would adopt them. They oftentimes even got the names of the murder victims. Mm. You can't do that. It is acceptable to kill somebody and bring back a scalp as proof that justice has been dealt. In April and May of 1759, the Cherokee, not getting justice by their allies, decided they had to get justice themselves. So they attacked, and they took the lives of approximately 40 sentiment. You tired? I'm sweaty. You're sweaty? Why are you sweaty for? We just walked. Uh, we didn't walk as much as I usually walk well, at home. Well, but it's a, it has an incline. Two places. I've been trying to get about walking about six miles in before we got up here for these meetings and taping this program. Are you doing six miles? Yeah, I do four without you, then two with you. Okay. So trying to get in shape. We're we're working on it. Uh, just so you know, today's a little different. I mentioned that we may go somewhere else. We did not go to that place today. Well, it, it looked like it was going to storm, which it is actually doing, getting ready to do now, but it may pass us by. And also, I thought it was pretty cool that they said we could take mm -hmm. at the fort, and he shared a lot of information, and we shared that on a program. It's hard to... to she's got mosquitoes. Mosquito, mosquito I've already got Several um, bites. Somebody didn't put the tent. It's on. hard to do places like that, like the fort and stuff. Um, but the guy shared some very, very good information. We really enjoyed it. We would recommend you go there. Oh, yeah. Uh, Two dollars a person yeah. for and a it, guided tour. That's amazing. And, and it, it opened it, up. What, an, about an, almost an hour long tour? It was. And it started in 2019, right before COVID hit. So that's when it really... Started. No, we said that it got finished in 2019, but I think, well, I know he said they did that. Uh, That's kind of when they opened up and started showing everything. Because he, they did a uh, like a reenactment in 2020, in February of 2020, before COVID really hit. And you'll have to see from the designs. Um, but I don't know if you got that on video. He said that with the fireplaces in the fort, the way the fort's built um he said while they were doing the reenactment it got as low as 25 degrees outside outside and they kept the interior around 60 so they were really pleased with that but those logs are just massive they are we did not tape the last part of it 
we did that. The battery went dead, but I also did it for a purpose because you do need to go visit. Uh, he shared some very good information at the end. Also, uh, the fort was attacked once, and that's what we didn't get on audio or on uh, video. So you need to go there and listen to it. It was really interesting, all the stuff they shared with us. Uh, so go there. Uh, also, the review of the campsite will be on the next episode, not on this episode. Mm -hmm. um, but we went and ate. Mm -hmm. And it was... It was really good. It was the Twisted Oak in downtown Statesville. And she Rodney took a picture of the menu, but I don't know how good the picture's going to be. It was dark. Yeah, it was very dark in there. I had to turn the flashlight on and no comments about how old I am, Alan. Um, but... Um, <laughs> I got this pan-seared trout with an like an orange cilantro sauce. It was so good. You ordered the short ribs, gray short ribs, but they were out. out. Um, so he ended up with a ribeye steak. But sandwich. I did do. We a got little, a caprese salad. It was really. Uh, it was good. I uh, I took the top of the bread off and just cut mm -hmm. it. Ate the bottom part of the bread. The service was really good. It was really good. Highly recommend if you're there to go eat. We really liked the and food. And we had a four point. Four we don't star. Understand. I'm not sure if some people have given them some bad reviews, but had a bad experience. But everything we, everything was fresh. Everything was good. The only thing that I could say was the Brussels sprouts. Excuse me, <laughs> were a little too salty. Um, okay, you give it in between an eight, eight and five and, and yeah, nine, and a half and a nine. And the reason it's there is because of the, too much salt. The fish was perfect. Delicious. Um, just cooked just right, but the Brussels sprouts they were good, they were just a little too salty. You had to kind of mix it with the pan sauce to cut down on the. the and you said you wish they would have offered you some kind of bread, even though you wouldn't have ate it, even though we wouldn't have eaten, there was no bread service. And I don't know, did she ask us, did we want dessert? No, but we told her we were watching, okay. But they did have uh, different desserts in there, too. Yeah. We just decided. She, your glass was filled. Constantly. And then she asked when we left, do you want to go tea? And um, so that, not all places do that. And that was nice. That was nice. So. So we recommend the place. Parking lot is small. Yes. It was downtown. Uh, and when we were leaving, somebody was using the parking lot as a cut through and like got beeped at us because he, he was trying to pull up the address. So um, oh, whoever fine. you were in that white <laughs> Ford truck. Um, but that's fine. We were just trying to get to the fort. So we were punching that in. But we had to get out of the place we were because there's a truck a moving delivery out. truck. So we couldn't sit there and just wait. So we had to kind of pull out to so the delivery yeah. truck. So watch in the evening. There is ample street parking. Um, but we were there during during lunch. So. So, so we recommend it. But we'll again talk about this campsite. You'll see some video as we're going off of the camper at the campsite. Uh, with the lights on, so you'll see a little bit of what the campsite is. But they have big plans for this campsite they've shared with me, and I want to share that with you. We were, again, like I told you, we're going to go with the owner, but just didn't, one of the owners, it just didn't work out on this trip. But uh, we'll share all of that on the next episode, and we'll go to the other location. So stay tuned to the next episode because we're on our way. And we're going to take a shower. <laughs> Bye. Bye.